Thanks for watching. So this video is gonna be really interesting to me. I hope it's also gonna be interesting to you. This is about a company called Ginkgo Bioworks. So what I find interesting is that there's a short seller that put out a really, really negative report, calling them the scam of the century, selling this as the biggest fraud we've seen in a long time. And then you have a company that is still operating, still raising financing, and is still developing. What I find really interesting is just looking at both sides and then forming your own opinion on what is going on here. This once again because I know a lot of YouTubers are doing that I'm trying to not do that is to be just negative obviously talked about Theranos I talk about Magic Leap I talk about WeWork and stuff like that so I'm trying to just be as neutral as I possibly can because these are all people and a lot of them are going to rebound I don't think Elizabeth Holmes is going to rebound but I can see someone like Adam Newman of WeWork rebound at some point I can see even Trevor Milton rebound at some point you never know what these people are going to do in the future so I'm not going to be too negative yeah actually i don't know what Trevor Milton. it depends if, if there's going to be like a fraud trial and a conviction or whatever but yeah so these are all people so let's look at that and let's not throw anyone under the bus even though there's someone screaming that they're a fraud and wants everybody to jump on it a little bit of background on ginkgo bioworks they were founded in 2019 they are basically all technical the ceo has a phd i think it was in, in bioengineering or whatever so they have very technical team they have like five founders and most of them are extremely technical and biology from MIT. So this is not a case where you have a company that doesn't know what they're doing. They very much know what they're doing. So they have some very senior people, even their founding team, they're a very, very senior member. And they also have very technical CEOs and stuff like that. This all checks out. So this is not a fake company. This is a real company with a very, very interesting project and product. So what they're doing is they're in the field of synthetic biology. So what they do is they program microorganisms, so genetically program microorganisms, to make them produce what you want them to produce. So this is something that's pretty old. I think there's a very famous example of how insulin is manufactured. So basically you have a microorganism that produces insulin and then you can recover that insulin. So you basically have a biological production facility. In the same way you would have an assembly line and this creates a product. You can have microorganisms in like huge containers or whatever, like huge fermentation parts and they produce a product for you. So that is the whole idea. So the twist that that Ginkgo Bioworks brings to the industry is that they want to move away from just creating one product, patenting that product, and then just having that. For example, some ingredient, something like insulin. They want to become almost like a tech platform. And this is where it gets a little bit fishy because this is kind of reminiscent of WeWork, where they said, we are not a real estate company, we're a tech company, because they also have that at least hinted at. So they're basically in a position where they're trying to position themselves as a platform and like a tech company. So what they want to do is they want to be almost like synthetic biology as a service, innovation as a service, where you want to create something using synthetic biology. You come on our platform, we give you the hardware, the software, the know-how, and you don't need to worry about any of that. So you can see a network approach. Since I'm already explaining it, let's go into the deck. Okay, I'm going to keep it brief because I know as soon as I go into pitch decks, the videos aren't as popular as the other ones, but they're really interesting to me. So I want to want to highlight a few things. So they released this investor deck. This is from this year, I think from May. So this is very, very recent. Okay, so here we see the motivation. The reason why they want this approach, this platform approach, is because they don't want to be pigeonholed in a certain industry. They don't want to be the company that only produces this one fragrance for the perfume industry. They don't want to be the company that has patented one thing. They have global ambitions. They want to be the platform that is good for food and agriculture, consumer technology, industrial and environment, and pharma and biotech. So they don't want to be pigeonholed in anything. They want to be in everything, and they want to be the platform in the same way Amazon or the App Store is the the platform. There are considerations with that because as soon as you want to be a platform, you have to show that there's a need for such a platform. There's a need for app stores, but there wouldn't be a need for an app store for free software because free software, you can just Google it, you can find it. You don't need a platform for that. The question is, is there a need? Is the platform a linchpin that you can actually put in the market and it's robust enough to remain? Something like Amazon. You can't circumvent Amazon in that way. So this is a different thing, but this is what they want to be. Then this is the plan they have. Direct your eyes at two 
things, the program layer, technology layer. So the layer number one would be, I would say the know-how. So what is it exactly that you wanna do? And then they have the technology layer, which is gonna be the hardware and the software. So this is the point where basically they give you the tools to do what you wanna do. And on the other side, they show you how you do what you wanna do. So they wanna be both. Because obviously it's not just software, you have a very, very hardware production intensive process. So they wanna provide you with all the tools that you would need. Now, these are their assumptions and this is what they believe to be true. So first of all, programming cells is very impactful. Obviously this is an assumption. Synthetic biology is a buzzword. I'm kind of in the funding and fundraising niche and I see a lot of consultants talking about synthetic biology because it's kind of like nano was, let's say 10 years ago, this is kind of the new buzzword or quantum, maybe a few years ago and still now, quantum computing and stuff like that. This is a buzzword. I see synthetic biology being used in the same way these other terms were used. So this is something that's kind of shiny and sparkly and a lot of funding is put into that. They say this is going to be very, very relevant. This is going to be very interesting. And then Ginkgo's platform improves with scale. So this is a bit of a critical one because I was researching quite a bit on this and there's another company that I'm also going to do a video on. They were also in the synthetic biology field and there's companies that are doing very well. They're doing hundreds of millions in revenues. From what I read, one of the challenges in synthetic biology are the profit margins and the scaling. So if you have a process, every synthetic researcher knows that if you have something that works on a small scale, it doesn't mean it works on a large scale. And even if it does, with the ingredients you need and the whole cost of the process, are you going to be profitable at the end? What I researched is that there can be an issue that if you don't reach scale, if you are not profitable at scale, you're going to have an issue. So if you can't scale all of these processes, you're going to have a big, big issue. So their assumption is that everything gets better with scale. If this is true, then this would be awesome. But this could be a very critical point here. But once again, I'm not being negative because the more I researched them, the more impressed I was with the idea. I can see this go down for sure. This can go down for sure. If all the allegations of the short sellers, which I'm going to get into in a bit, if they are all true, then this would be pretty bad. If they were true, the allegations, then it would be really, really bad. So they can go down. But just looking at the idea and what they're trying to do, I say, why not? It sounds really interesting. Yeah, they want to become the industry standard if they can achieve that. And then the value increases with each new program. I'm always interested if I see something that is accumulating over time, it doesn't matter what it is, expertise, data, you keep accumulating. At some point, you become a ridiculous juggernaut of data like Google or Amazon because you just know so much. And if they can be that in this industry, then I can really see this being successful. But yeah, these are the assumptions. So this is interesting. Once again, this is for investors. So this is what they put into the public domain, basically. So they can show that, yes, their cost per strain. So these are basically the unit costs that are going down. If you fake your data, then there's nothing you can say. So this looks good. But then again, there are two things. The data has to be correct. I'm going to assume that it is correct. I'm going to assume that what they're showing me is correct. And I'm also going to assume that the investors did the due diligence so they wouldn't dare to put in something that's completely false. Let's assume it's correct. But then also how relevant is that? Because I can see that there could be other issues that are not reflected here. I could see that there are maybe costs for the production at scale because this is a cost per strain test. I could see that there are other metrics that might not look like that where they have issues with keeping these things profitable. So this might not be everything, but it looks good. To my eye, as someone who's not an expert, it definitely looks good. Okay, so here it gets a little bit fishy because when you see this one called Carlo Ingredients, so this is one of the major criticism that the short seller, Scorpion Capital is the short seller I'm talking about. I'm going to get into that in a bit. But this is where it gets a little bit fishy because they create their own spin-off, which they invest in with parts of their own investor money, but also with some of the investors that invest in them also invest in these companies. But then these new spin-offs pay them back. So you basically have revenues coming from that company. This is an allegation. So here's the thing. If they don't give access to these books, then we're not going to know. But one of the allegations by the short seller was that they create a spinoff, invest in that spinoff, and then have fake revenues coming back. This is a pretty big allegation because then you're basically faking your revenues with your investors' money, which obviously you shouldn't do. If you now look at it in a positive way, so I don't want to be negative, if you look at it in a positive way, they have a lot of different revenue streams and approaches to make money. And I 
think you always have to really honor the entrepreneurial spirit, especially if you have such a technical team. You have a CEO who's basically a biologist, PhD in bioengineering, and someone who then goes to the market is in my eyes always better than someone who has no idea about the technology and just trying to sell. So I have a lot of respect for that. So to be positive, here's what they have. So first of all, the foundry part is where they are aiming to give companies the tools. And I guess I'm not 100% on this, but these can be companies they create themselves. So spin-offs basically. All these can also be companies like large companies that come to them and they ask them, hey, we don't have the facilities. We don't have the experience. Can you give us the technology, the software, the tools to do this? And then they say, yes, we can do this for you. And they get a commission fee. So this is basically synthetic biology as a service where they provide you with a service where they take care of all the overhead of all the heavy thinking and you can just pay them for the service and then you get your result. And I guess there's also different stages where maybe you have the hardware, you don't have the software, or maybe you have hardware and software, but you don't have the know-how. Maybe you have the know-how, you like the hardware and software. So I can see that. So this in itself has to be validated, but just taking it as it is sounds like a good idea. And then the other part of that is the downstream value. So as soon as they help you develop something, so let's say they help you develop an organism that produces insulin. Obviously, this is old, but let's say they help you produce an organism that produces insulin, then they get royalties on that. So different things, either royalties on your product sales. So let's say now you are selling insulin, they actually take a cut of whatever you're selling. So this is the royalty part. Or if you don't want to give them the royalty, maybe they just take equity in your company. Large companies are probably not going to do that. But a very small company that just doesn't have the resources and they don't want to handle royalty, or maybe they're looking for an investor who really has experience, then they say, hey, we give you ownership in our company if you help us develop this new insulin producing microorganism. If you just look at that, and if this works, then this is going to be a huge money generator. They don't have that yet, according to their own financials. I believe they don't have that yet, at least not a few months ago. But this sounds really interesting. So they take ownership in companies. I think a lot of companies are going to be guarding on that. No company likes to hand out ownership for a service. But the royalty, I can see that. It's probably limited. It's probably not royalties forever. It's probably going to be a time limit. There's probably also ways you can move around that. If you have a patent that goes 10 years and you know royalties are going to be paid for two years, maybe you're going to postpone the market launch just so you don't have to, I don't know, don't have to pay the royalties or maybe they don't care. But yeah, sounds interesting. So very positive here. Yeah, this also has been a criticism. But then again, this is their own decision. They don't not showing the profits. They're showing the revenues from this first revenue stream that I just showed. So this is basically their revenues. By the way, this should be all million here. So this is $30 million. These are the actuals. If the short seller is correct, Scorpion Capital, then some of these might actually be incorrect and actually be due to the investments they put in these spin-offs and then they took the money back. I don't know. I can't say anything to that. I'm just going to reflect the rumors back, but I'm not going to validate the statement. So yeah, so this is the revenue foundry is where they have the spin-offs or they help you develop these products and no profits here, which is a little bit sad because I didn't really put that in. And then they have basically some cash flow metrics. <laughs> this is hilarious because this is the same thing we saw before. We hope that when technology meets biology, life finds a way. This is a very famous quote from Jurassic Park. I don't know why they put that in there. Life finds a way. Actually, I would have changed the quote. I would have said, instead of saying that we help life find a way, sounds much better to say that we hope that when technology meets biology, life finds a way. It sounds Sounds like the life finds a way is it doesn't fit to the sentence. We hope that when technology meets biology, we make money, I guess, because you're already there, not life finds a way. But then again, I'm a writer, I always like to be nitpicky about these things. This is another slide of financials. And now we have a little bit more info because we have the earnings, basically. So what we see here in brackets, presumably is supposed to be negative. So we see that these are the revenues they have. So this is from the foundry. So this is when they do the whole service and maybe spinoffs, maybe companies that want them to produce for them. And did they also add the other revenue they haven't added all of their projected revenues yet so they kind of left that blank but what you can see is that they're going to have negative profits for quite a long time so until 2024 which is normal if you have a company like that although they already have revenues so you don't know if they think they're going to be unprofitable because they're going to have some heavy R&D investments or it's just because their margins don't pay up their cost of goods sold are so high or the unit economics have so slim margins that they can't really have a profit yet or is it because 
they keep investing in new things and these investments are going to be less in the future. But you can see that in 2025, they project that they are going to have profits. If you just calculate that, that's 15%. That's actually pretty low. If you consider it being the first year of profitability is fine, you have to see where it ends up. But 15% seems very, very low. But then again, they didn't add everything. If you just look at the financials, these are projections you never know with projections. And also they haven't included all of the revenue they project. They might be extra conservative to cover the base because you don't want to tell an investor that you're going to make a lot of money in five years because the investors might get really angry with you at some point and then they might pull any further investment. So I think what they're doing here is they want to be very clear. We are not going to make money soon. We have a vision. So I think this is probably a good way to do it for the investors. Obviously, you can always show more financials, but this is public. They don't want to show me all their stuff. They want to show their stuff to the investors. So I'm not going to be negative here. Okay, now just at the end, let's go to the allegations. So the allegations are quite interesting because first of all, they're a part of Scorpion Capital, which is a short seller, meaning that they bet on the company value going down. If you invest in the stock market, you usually bet on it going up. You put money in a stock and then you hope it's going up and then you sell and then you make money. What they're betting on is that the stock price is going down. If it goes down, they make money. It's the reverse of how you would envision that. So a short seller is betting on the money going down. So there is an issue of a conflict of interest, meaning that there's an issue of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you are a short seller who has a lot of weight, whose opinion has a lot of weight, you might be in a position where you put out a tweet and then the stock price goes down, which is what happened with Ginkgo Bioworks. As soon as they tweeted out their report, their stock price went down like 24 percent or something that was a pretty strong impact they make money just by putting out the news irrespective of the news is correct or not so it's very difficult to look at these two things and say okay is it a fraud is it not a fraud because this one is making money by calling them out even if their call out is incorrect so this is always a caveat you have to think about a second thing that i actually found unnecessary is that their report was written in a tone that i find takes away from the message if i write a report i want it to be clear Clear. I want it to be well written and I want it to be in a neutral and polite way presenting the facts and explaining what my conclusion is. I don't want to write things like, oh, this is ridiculous. This is horrible. I wouldn't have a very negative tone in the report, but they do. If the allegations are true, then this would be pretty bad. So first of all, they did a lot of interviews. They interviewed their customers. They interviewed former employees at Ginkgo Bioworks. They interviewed some of the spin-offs that we talked about and a lot of other people. So they really tried to get a lot of info. If everything they say is true, this would be really, really bad. Then they talk about the shell game. It's a dubious shell game. And this is what they're talking about. They create spin-offs. They invest in the spin-offs. The spin-offs give them money back as revenues. This is fake. If this is true, then this is fake. So they have, or at least this is misleading. Even if it wasn't illegal, it would still be extremely misleading because then Ginkgo Bioworks could put in 50 million in revenues. Even this comes from 50 million in investor money. This is what they mean with related party revenues. So they're basically in a position where they have related parties who give them revenues, but these revenues are quote unquote fake if what they're saying is true. And then there's a lot of rumors. So you can't base so much on rumors, but they're saying a lot of employees are actually being very negative about this business model where they have these related parties and they're just going to be bullied out and fired if they complain. So I don't know if this is true. This is rumors. You can't condemn a company for rumors because you don't know. Clearly, there were a lot of rumors about Steve Jobs being like a bully and being really negative, but it worked out. I mean, clearly it worked out. This is a company, a lot of people love Apple. So you can't say that this company is a fraud because there might be some bullying or people's opinions aren't highlighted. It's really hard to say here. Yeah. I'm going to skip the report because it's so long. It's 175 pages, the whole report. So let's just keep it simple. Number one, the allegation is that they have fake revenues. They invest in a company they created and then they give the money back as revenues. So this would be fake if this was true. And then some interviews with customers hint that these customers have not paid them. So they basically list cash income from a customer and then the short seller calls them uh, hey did you actually pay them and then they say no we didn't pay them anything we actually didn't have the money for that and the service was so bad that we actually wouldn't pay them this is a rumor we don't have a name we have a name of the company but we don't have a name of the person who's actually can validate that the cfo of the company or we know we never paid them but this is the allegation that they actually never got paid but they put fake revenues in the pnl and then that employees were fired because they complained about things not being true or not being accurate once again this is a rumor we don't have proof of that 
the next one that technology doesn't work so they basically went to competitors because it just didn't work so they talk about okay we give you the technology and then you can do synthetic biology as a service alas it doesn't work once again this is an allegation and number five this is kind of the big one so if i look at that company and i see okay maybe they have fake revenues maybe it's not fraudulent it's just deceptive so what they're doing is legal it's just not a nice thing to do then i would actually be fine with that if they are doing that and they're a legit company they probably have a reason of doing that so if this is legal i'm fine with that i don't care because i know it can be really difficult to have such a deep tech project and to really get it to the market if this is something they have to do for a reason that i don't understand or that i don't know because i'm not in the company then this is fine with me as long as it's not illegal i think this would be perfectly fine but this last allegation is that they actually have no magic what i mean by that is that every technology has the magic that makes it worse or the ip or the core of what you do differently the reason why you can do something that nobody else is doing for them the magic is their know-how their software and the hardware they buy the hardware from basically as list items so these are items they don't create them they just buy them the software is something that they create themselves obviously and then the know-how is something that they should have in-house because they're all very technical so they're going to accumulate the know-how but the accusation is that if they are no better than other CROs meaning contractual research organizations they are no better than any research organization any CRO that you can hire to do synthetic biology for you they're basically like that they don't have special hardware they don't have special software and everything that they're claiming to have is a hoax because they claim to be a platform but this platform doesn't exist because they buy all this stuff in there and everything they have isn't special this is an allegation I don't know if this is true but this is an allegation if this was to be true then I can see that this business is gonna at least not happen in the way the CEO or the team thinks and I can also see that this company might go under if they actually don't have this magic they claim to have if their whole package of the hardware software and know-how is insufficient compared to CROs then I can see this going down provided that all of the other allegations aren't illegal they're just deceptive this number five this one where okay they don't have the magic I can see this bring down the company so what is the conclusion for that there's going to be more videos on Ginkgo because I generally find that company interesting I find it's an interesting company I hope that they succeed I hope that their vision of becoming a platform within this field called synthetic biology even though it's a buzzword even though it's not that new their vision of becoming a platform for programming microorganisms to produce certain compounds I generally hope that this comes true the CEO already responded in the next video there's going to be interviews he says that yes the spin-offs this is what we want to do we want to be a platform the whole idea is of enabling companies that have no idea about synthetic biology to enable them to do that so maybe there is a space for them even if they don't have as much magic as they claim and then how does it go with the investors their stock dropped 24 percent but one of their major investors doubled down on the investment invested much more and they've raised much more since so they are doing very very well and i hope that they're going to succeed and in the next videos we're going to look at the ceo and the management team looking at a few interviews i know people don't like pitch decks too much i hope this wasn't too boring let me know